let me make the formal introductions, if I may. Senator Mark Warner is known, I know, to all of you. He's a member of the Senate's Banking Committee and Chairman of the Subcommittee on Security and International Trade and Finance. He's been a key leader in bipartisan efforts to effectively update oversight of Wall Street and end taxpayer bailouts of failing financial firms. He leads a bipartisan task force that is looking for ways to increase accountability and improve government performance to reduce federal budget deficits. Senator Warner also sits on the Senate's Commerce and Rules Committee. And if I may say very proudly, you also were co-chair of our report with the Atlantic Council on transatlantic cooperation on financial, finance reform, entitled The Danger of Divergence. We also are very fortunate to have with us this morning uh, EU Ambassador Joao Baeda Alameda. Ambassador Alameda is the head of delegation of the European Union to the United States. In this capacity, he represents European Commission President Jose Manuel Borroso and President of the European Council, Herman van Rompuy, under the authority of the High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Catherine Ashton. Ambassador Alameda also served on our task force in the writing of the Danger of Divergence. So, Join me in welcoming our uh, speakers uh, this morning. Please. <laughs> now, I mentioned to them before you came in that uh, we are going to pose some questions, and there might be maybe some initial comments you might want to make. But I thought that we'd start with a very uh, broad question, and that is, uh, is uh, basically looking back, Senator, if I could say, it's uh, almost a year since uh, Dodd-Frank uh, has passed. Um, where are we? How would you basically uh, evaluate, uh, if I could say, the performance of the regulators, where we are now, where we need to go next? Uh, are are uh, the regulators meeting Congress's intentions with the passage of that legislation? Let's start with that broad question. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for being here. And first of all, my apologies for, um, for being a bit tardy. I, as, um, and you know, prior to being senator, I had the honor of serving as governor of Virginia, and uh, I'd love to go through all the litany of wonderful things that we uh, were able to accomplish when I was governor. Unfortunately, not on that list was solving the Virginia's transportation problems. So, <laughs> uh, traffic this particular band this morning. Obviously, they gave me a little late. Um, Two or three just kind of opening framing comments. Uh, I think that Don Frank, um, one of the ways I think that Don Frank kind of got it basically right, and, and there are parts uh, where I'd love to see changes, but uh, is that I, in the aftermath of Don Frank, um, I think I received an almost equal amount of criticism from both sides. Uh, a number of folks who said, oh my gosh, you've let the banks and the institutions off scot-free and they're going to steal more the muck. I, uh, I got a huge number of those comments and then I got a huge number of, oh my gosh, you've tied their hands so much you've killed capitalism. So as long as you get that kind of uh, uh, incoming critique from both sides, I'm not saying that the balance exactly right, but I think there is uh, some balance there. I think one of the challenges, particularly with the new house, is that uh, uh, those areas where there were needs for tweaks, needs for changes, uh, parts that I don't think we, we got right, end user def, you know, making clear about end users on the, uh, uh, for, for derivatives and the definitions, um, is made much more difficult in terms of legislative tweaks because you're not we could get a bill that would amend certain parts of Dodd-Frank to kind of fix where there might have been overreach. That would be great. The concern with the House now is anything you put out might lead to a relitigation of the whole issue. Uh, and I generally find, and I'm using, so the ambassador was over and the bus was over um, a month or so ago, I generally think our European partners while they are not again, fully satisfied with all aspects of Dodd-Frank, they're glad we went ahead and went first. At least there's a framework here which we can, can work through. 
Um, two other quick, two or three other quick comments. One, um, in retrospect, in terms of the regulators, I wish there had been able to be more um, consolidation. And I still think that we made some minor regulatory consolidation. Some of the things as a new member of the uh, of the uh, banking committee, and, uh, I came in perhaps naively thinking, you know, here's this chance to relook at our whole regulatory structure. Do we really need all of these entities? And wouldn't it be better to have <coughs> a single banking regulator, or a single um, regulator on the, uh, uh, between the SEC and CFTC? Um, I got a graduate education very quickly. And power of the status quo, um, and uh, some of that uh, consolidation didn't take place. I still think there are challenges between the SEC and the CFTC, and those challenges are exacerbated because of the efforts to try, particularly on the, on the SEC, to cut back on its funding. And I mean, we've seen with challenges like the flash crash uh, and others where the SEC clearly needs um, resources just on the technology side, for example, to keep up. And, uh, and those continuing kind of uh, jockeying for position between the SEC and the CFTC give me pause. I'm particularly, as someone who, along with Senator Corker from Tennessee, were very, was very involved in the uh, Title I and Title II with the Resolution Authority, the, the Systemic Risk Council, um, the, hopefully of the ending of Too Big to Fail, uh, I think we did put some good speed bumps in place there. I continue to worry whether the FSOC is going to have the heft that we were hoping it was going to have. Uh, and a final comment, at least in terms of this opening general statement, um, it has been, it has been uh, interesting experience over the, since the passage of the legislation, as I've seen major financial institutions come in and talk to me in the office and say, you know, Senator, uh, my gosh, we've got all of these uh, incredible myriad of regulations, we're having to sort through all of these, and, and um, it's, it's a real challenge, uh, can't we get some more delay? Uh, and about eight out of every ten times when these financial institutions have come in and tried to raise these concerns, I've had to remind them that in almost every case, it was the very financial institution themselves who had said, please, Congress, don't define the rules. Kick this to the regulators because we don't trust you to make the judgment. Um, so I do think there's, you know, it's, it's appropriate at times to refresh some of their memories about uh, how we got to this, uh, uh, this regulatory path. So, Net, net, I give us about a B at this point. Uh, I think there's going to be still you know, the next phase as we kind of plod through this domestically is trying to make sure we get this right with our international partners. I think the question is, is much more open on that front, and I look forward to working with the ambassador and others to make sure that we try to get that harmonization. Senator, before I do go to Ambassador Alameda, let me just uh, ask you one more question relevant to a couple of points that you mentioned, because I know two of the big issues out there are certainly the issue you referred to it, the question of budgets and the need for budgets in order to be able to uh, implement uh, the, the uh, agenda, the proposed agenda. At the same time, there's also this question of timing. And the question I think that's in the uppermost of um, many uh, as there are hearings and other discussions and with the proposed legislation for delaying Dodd-Frank by 18 months, is uh, their consideration being given on the part of Democrats for extending deadlines in return for bigger budgets for the SEC and CFTC at this, uh, at this time? I've not heard. Heard those kind of discussions and maybe going on. Um, been a bit involved in another effort recently, a so called Gang of Six, uh, simply trying to solve the whole <coughs> debt crisis. Uh, but uh, um, I, I think that, that kind of 
I would rather us continue to kind of slog through this process. I think that you know some kind of um, delay doesn't make sense. As a matter of fact, you know, I, I find finding our European partners um, again, while not uh, liking everything that they've we've done in Dodd Frank, at least it, at least it gives a framework that they can kind of bounce ideas against and. Delay, uh, to my mind, doesn't make any sense, particularly as we've seen, you know, the, as the focus has moved appropriately to perform with our European partners, I think also the G20 level two, the challenges of, of, of debt crisis uh, in various countries within the EU, the notion that we would somehow that delay in setting up a new set of rules will do anything to kind of bring further stability to the financial uh, system. It just doesn't make sense to me. I'd rather kind of, let's plot through this. It will need to be amended. It will need to be changed. But let's go ahead and let the regulators finish the job, get the first set of rules out. And if we need to amend after that, uh, we can move forward. But uh, I think uh, an 18-month delay with this, with the with the challenges we face both from the uh, potential debt crisis, the increasing challenges we're seeing around high frequency trading, with the challenges we're seeing in, in the cyber area, all efforts that could undermine financially significant institutions. If we don't have in place, uh, again, from the, the, the particularly the very large significant financial institutions, some of those would what I've always called speed bumps. The institution chooses to be uh, financially significant. That's their right. There ought to be some speed bumps along the way to make sure that uh, we've got some uh, uh, ability from the systemic standpoint to uh, um, ensure they don't get too far out there without uh, oversight or early warning signals, both in terms of capital, leverage. Uh, I, I think one of the areas that is going to be needs a lot of work uh, that is still a um, kind of work in process is both the convertible debt requirement and the so-called funeral plans. I think you know, the jury is still out whether those tools are going to be really useful, um, particularly on international organizations, how we do a funeral plan in, 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 in an orderly way that has a wide international footprint. I don't think delaying that process uh, Serving, serving the international trade finance as well. Thank you very much, uh, Senator. Ambassador Alameda, let's uh, uh, to get a, a broad sense from you of where things are. I know the timeline for the Mifid II proposal has uh, slipped a bit, and I think that uh, the expectation was in the summer, I, I, I believe. Um, I know that the G20 had the commitments on derivatives trading for implementation by December of 2012. And just give us a sense, you know, do you, how do you feel the process is going? Some of the issues that we confronted, which I, I went right to it with the senator, you know, that this question of our resources, the question of timing, you're also confronting these, and albeit in a different way, but please, uh, if you would address how you see things going with regulatory reform on uh, the other side of the Atlantic. Thank, thank you very much, uh, for this initiative, I'd like to praise the Atlantic Council, the Commons, Thompson Reuters, for bringing this issue to the, the universe of the think tank activity in Washington. It was missing a few months ago, and you, you filled the, the void, and uh, I think you should be praised for that. Uh, let me say a very kind word toward uh, Senator Warner, which we've been meeting a couple of times, and I always appreciate his commitment to looking at all these issues also with the transatlantic angle. Uh, and I think, and this is my first point, it's crucial that we don't miss this uh, across the common perspective. Uh, it, it, it will be uh, very dangerous if on our side, Europeans, we look at our markets and our situation, regardless of what happens in the United States and vice versa. So I think this, this point, and in this room, in this building, with, uh, with such a procedure center, I, I think it's the main point to make uh, at the very, at the very start. Um, my second question would be 
about the cooperation between the EU and the US and what we've been doing together. And I think this is a good story. Uh, we have a success story in terms of the way we have cooperated so far. I've been in debates, including with the Senator, about is it uh, half full or half empty uh, glass. Uh, I definitely on the camp of the half full. But I'm also in the camp of those who say that we do not necessarily need the glass to be totally full. That is, we don't need identical uh, legislation, identical rules. What we need is for these rules to be uh, consistent and compatible. And that is uh, to the benefit of our economies, both economies and the world economy as such. Because our starting point has been, and I believe should continue to be, uh, the commitments we made inside of Japan, uh, beyond the transatlantic dimension, many other countries uh, were also, are also committed to implementing, which uh, is not guidelines, the G20 are not guidelines, the G20 uh, conclusions are committed, so I think our countries should uh, stick to that path, uh, revamping the way our uh, global economy is organized, particularly in, in this sector, for reasons that you know. But my third point is to say that uh, we should be very attentive to the risk of complacency. And I couldn't agree more with the Senator when he said delaying is not the solution. Implementing is the solution. Implementing in a balanced way, respecting the differences in the uh, respective situations, in a compatible and consistent This is what we should do. This is, I believe, the best service we can provide to our economies and to our citizens. And that is what we're doing in the European Union. And now I reply more directly to Paul's question. I think we are on track. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, we have fundamentally revamped our mechanisms of supervision. We have created a, a totally new architecture for the supervision of financial markets in Europe. This is a, a small revolution, if not a big revolution, in the way we organize our markets. Uh, and I think uh, we are absolutely on the right track. The latest news I have uh, from Brussels is to say that uh, a big package will come in the summer, around summer or before summer. Uh, President Mahoud and, and Commissioner Barnier are fully committed to it. And, uh, you know, our decision-making procedures are different from yours. So we cannot make a package like Bobby <coughs> Frank. It's not the way we do business in Europe. We, we are slightly more complicated things, but I hope that the results will be at the same level of ambition and, and relevance. And so my target today, or my commitment today, or my prediction, if I can be more cautious, is that by the end of 2013, the whole new set of legislation will be not only proposed, but actually in, in application uh, by uh, the end of 2013, beginning of 2014, the whole new regulatory universe that the European Union will be uh, up and running. And this is largely a product of that. What we are feeling in Europe as well, as much as in here, is the need to keep the momentum, keep the focus. People here and there don't necessarily feel the urgency as much as they felt two years ago. I think it's the role of politicians and responsible uh, officials to, uh, to make sure that the momentum is kept and that we stick to our commitments and that together in good cooperation we should not. Thank you. Let me uh, pursue this issue of harmonization a little bit more because in fact both of you have, uh, starting last year, I think made very thoughtful comments, have kept these issues in the forefront of your minds. And Senator, I know when we were here before, that was an appeal that you made. So you were not only looking at uh, this issue on this side of the Atlantic, but what are the ramifications for our businesses, our industry, and working cooperatively with Europe? Let me ask you, you know, clearly industry would like some certainty uh, and in this process. And the question is, with you know, harmonization, do you feel comfortable that, uh, that that kind of certainty can in fact be achieved? For example, you know, will industry be able to continue uh, to use clearinghouses or trading platforms in each other's jurisdiction? 
Um, how are we going to work through pieces like that? Another one that I'll, I'll just pick out that comes up that we hear uh, is that the EU has some rules that it's uh, some tough rules that it's uh, putting in place for banker compensation. And then the question is on that, okay, is that going to create a system of uh, unfair competition? You know, how do you address those? Uh, if, if you could vote. Well, one process um, idea that we've been, my office has been exploring and shared a little bit with the ambassador and then over the Brussels Forum trying to share with some other colleagues over there is that we, we have established ties between <coughs> central bankers who meet on a regular basis. We have established ties between finance ministers. What we have not really put in like a structured place is uh, established ties between parliamentarians and members of Congress on an ongoing basis. Uh, I, I hope to use this uh, one of the conversations with, with the former Chairman Volcker about the, the notion of could we create some ongoing or formalized structure so that that um, those of us in the Congress, Democrat and Republican House and Senate, that have both interest and responsibilities in this you know, international finance field could have a deeper relationship with some of our colleagues uh, on the other side of the farm, particularly as the, the EU Parliament increases its, its power and prestige is there, you know, because at some point we're going to need to come back and, and amend and change from a legislative standpoint. And if you know, finance ministers come and go, and uh, maybe central bankers don't come and go quite as rapidly, but uh, it, at least it seems on this side that uh, members of Congress seem to stay forever. Uh, you know, uh, so um, uh, you know, having those kind of uh, legislative relationships so that there is that kind of ongoing relationship to kind of change and then and alter rules. And that, that structure doesn't exist. And there seems to be a, a real appetite uh, uh, for that. How, what form we take that, you know, how we make it something more than kind of an annual codel back and forth. So there's a really uh, an ongoing parliamentary exchanges uh, would be uh, uh, one way to keep this, this harmonization going. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I think the, the point you made, uh, Paul, is an important one. It was implicit in my uh, initial remarks. Uh, there is a risk that, uh, uh, two risks, basically, that we lose momentum and we lose interest and we lose focus on what we need to do and we forget what we're doing. And the, 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 the root causes and the, the, the deep reason that's one risk. And the other risk is that here and there we increase uh, the possibility of uh, regulatory harmony. And I think these two risks should be uh, up front uh, in politicians and uh, diplomats. Uh, we certainly, uh, I certainly am trying to put that very much across to my colleagues in Brussels. Uh, but in certain areas, as I said, also, we should not aim at identical regulation because we have different situations different past history and different cultures. And the, the, the point you made about remuneration and compensation is one in which I believe there is a difference of culture uh, between the EU and the US. We've seen that in the debate. Uh, I'm sure we can find solutions that prevent uh, the risk of, uh, of regulatory arbitrage or the risk of unfair competition. Uh, but we have, in certain domains, except to accept that our differences that we need to, uh, to be on the cooperation, I was um, on the way over here, and I don't give you Virginia, so my commuting time was slightly shorter than that. <laughs> uh, but I will be visiting the very so, uh, uh, and, I, and I love your state. But I live in DC, so my, my commuting time was a bit shorter. But still, I was able to look at the, at the, the report that my colleague Jonathan Fall, who is the Director General for Internal Market and Financial Services, did of his very recent 
Washington and New York. And I was impressed once again by the depth, the scope, and the magnitude of you know, the issues that, the importance of the issues that he has discussed with his colleagues. If I look at the commissioner level, I mean, I don't, I, I didn't have any commissioner coming more often to the United States than Michel Barnier in my last uh, 10 months, and he's announcing two more visits, right, uh, two more visits to, to the U.S., uh, talking to everybody uh, that comes uh, in this process, and I sincerely hope we have a chance to meet with Senator Warner uh, as well. Uh, on the parliamentary side, Parliament of Congress, I couldn't agree more with the Senate. We have to involve the, those who produce the legislation. And the European Parliament has more powers than it had before in doing so. And I know a number of people are committed to that, and by the way, we discussed a lot uh, about these issues as well. Uh, I'm very much in favor of you know, intensifying all dialogue possible on these matters. My uh, view of things today, my assessment today, is a very positive. Officials level, commissioner level, hopefully in the future even more so parliamentary level. This is the way to work, is that people talk, that people discuss, that people exchange views and ideas. And then there will remain some points of disagreement, some points of difference, and some of them justified, on some of them we need to work more, but it's the attitude that I would like to praise and I so far I'm extremely happy with what happens in this particular policy domain. So happy about other policy domains where we still need to, to improve, but here I think we are on the track. Let me just, let me just add two other very brief points. One is I um, agree with the ambassador that you know, there will be different sets of rules uh, because of what you mentioned in terms of culture. It, it, it has been um, interesting uh, to watch as uh, both the UK and the EU set up new rules. I hear less of what I heard two plus years ago of large financial institutions you know, wagging their finger in my face saying, Mark, if you don't get this right, we're moving to name the location uh, because you know, other countries are uh, uh, moving to London diminished greatly by the bank tax was uh, proposed in the UK. Um, and, and I do think, to that point of making sure there's not regulatory arbitrage, I think we can have a different set of rules uh, and, and based on our culture, what we, we do need to guard against is that kind of both the EU, the UK, Japan, and others, that we don't allow a regulatory arbitrage to kind of outlier countries that are kind of outside what we would have in <coughs> the first tier financial institution. What we don't want to see is an ability to go to the kind of lowest common denominator in some uh, in a country that says we're going to you know, try to attack, uh, attract financial institutions based upon the, uh, um, the lowest standard of oversight. And, and you can have different <coughs> requirements there. I'm going to ask if there are those from the audience to please raise your hands if you'd like to ask a question. Um, and ask you to introduce yourselves. But I, I have, as we're doing that for a moment, let me do one follow up on this. Um, it's very interesting, Senator, to hear you know, about thought being given in your discussions about having kind of a mechanism. I think uh, you know that would look beyond just what is happening broadly in the rulemaking <coughs> process, meaning. Getting down into, if you will, some other granularity here. Looking at precisely, all right, well, these are the rules we've established. What are the actual, what's the actual impact on our respective industries? How does it really uh, uh, impact? And what I heard you say is what you're trying to do is, is to actually have an ongoing dialogue that in a certain way will look at this level of granularity. I mean, literally getting into whether it be it capital requirements, getting into specifics that affect industry, look at through our prison and look at through the European prison. Is it fair to say that uh, the mechanism that you're proposing is seeking to achieve that? Well, 
I think it's important that <clears throat> on the parliamentary side, we at least have parliamentary members who are aware of, of what the capital requirements are, what the leverage ratios are, what, you know, <coughs> How, how the playing out of this <coughs> convertible debt idea that we uh, uh, put in place and you know, some knowledge about the uh, uh, dissolution plans or the funeral plans and you know, better understanding of, of the rules rolling out on, on you know, I see some of the critiques of uh, Dodd Frank that, that look like uh, we're going to have government regulators kind of willy nilly. Uh, taking over firms and, and putting up the resolution when we try to, we believe we set up a system that, you know, that would strongly encourage traditional bankruptcy and resolution to be a course of last resort, kind of maybe using the uh, Roach Motel analogy with once you check in, you never check out. Um, you know, but if we didn't get it right, we need to, we need to have uh, parliamentary members Having, I think, enough understanding and understanding of our colleagues in Europe about what they're doing, so that if we do need to come back with with legislative fixes, there's that knowledge. I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't want to be again presumptuous here, but I'm not sure. Prior to the crisis, how many members of Congress really understood the status and implications of the Basel discussions. You know, we're going to need to know that in Congress because it's, you know, it's going to have to come back and be, uh, we at least need to know to be able to keep the pressure on so that if we get the Basel III, we actually get it implemented this time. And, and you know, we recognize uh, how we kind of sort through different transparency rules so that, you know, so that uh, uh, we have this kind of level playing field between institutions on both sides of the Atlantic. But, and I just uh, believe that this area is not one that's, um, that can be simply left to the regulators, the central bankers, and the finance ministers. Maybe, maybe a comment on this one. Uh, I, I think what we've seen from since uh, 2008 was uh, that all of us as well a lot more about financial markets than we, we knew before, or even that we wanted to know about uh, And I've seen also the, a very steep learning curve of our leaders. And two years ago, uh, I don't think none of them would be able to have the kind of discussions they have today about financial markets and all the issues. So this issue of, of uh, uh, you know, education of, of the elites and those who make decisions at this point, I think it's a, it's a fundamental one. And I think particularly as far as legislation are concerned, uh, I think you can count on the European Parliament uh, Committee specialized on this issue. We'll find uh, knowledgeable people and responsible people who are ready to, to, to engage with you, and I can only support that. Let, let me go back to, uh, uh, but also in, in, this, in this field still, uh, I think that the kind of monitoring and the impact assessment and evaluation of what we're doing has to be <coughs> first and foremost by the authorities and those who are responsible. But I think there's an important role for the civil society. And the, the report that uh, that gathered put together uh, last year, uh, and, and reports like these, and initiatives like this, I think are very important for us on the you know, political side, the diplomatic side, for legislators to get the feedback also from those who are uh, observing uh, what we do. Uh, my second point is about uh, uh, what you said, Senator, about uh, preventing uh, you know, operators from moving elsewhere. I think that the key for that is the G20. And the G20 is not only the US and the EU. Uh, all the others subscribe to the same community. I'm not sure that they're all following with the same degree of uh, discipline and commitment as, as the EU and the US. And I think this is an issue that uh, I think we should bring back to the G20 uh, in a way of making sure that uh, everybody moves in the same direction uh, along the same 
lines that have been agreed by all. And, uh, you know, the excellent work by, done by a number of institutions uh, goes in that direction. But I think that again, inside the G20, we should not lose the momentum. And we should not lose the perspective that this is not only an issue for the US and the EU, this is not our problem. This is a problem for the global economy, and we all have to find a solution. Thank you. We're going to come to just a few questions and then we're going to wrap up. I'm going to take a number of questions. I see three hands. The gentleman in the back, the gentleman here and here. Why don't we take all three of them? Could you uh, please, sure. if you'd introduce yourself, we'll take all three. I'm Robert Schred, I'm president of International Investor. And first I'd like to address the senator. Uh, your voice has been most welcome uh, because of your financial knowledge on the, on the Senate committee. Uh, I think your point's well taken that not enough members maybe had all that experience and, and knowledge. But going forward, uh, I'd like you to return to the moderator's opening question, which was, we still see a lot of lobbyists descending on Washington, wrestling with the CFTC and the SEC as they try to make their rules congruent. Are we going to see this finally put in place and cemented so we know Dodd-Frank will move forward? And can you give us an idea of when you think that might take place? And secondly, as we look at the world of the future, <coughs> we don't want to be in a position where we're always looking at the last crisis and not the one ahead. We're going to be looking not just at European and American players, but players from all over the world. Are we going to have a flexible enough system that we can address threats no matter where they're coming from and whatever institutions they're coming from? Okay, good questions. Uh, let's go right here and then here. Yes. Yeah, great, Bishop. I, uh, on the panel later, I think the Chair is going to be a uh, two, two points. First of all, uh, once you have one of much broader than just mission, the total package here, that's what it's referred to, is about 30 different measures, very, very widespread. But that's not a very specific case. Hey, that's a huge package of the transatlantic relations. There are now two bits on the table for the New York Company. One for Germany and one for Russia. Okay, thank you. And sir. until I got this job, how much congressional and jurisdictional oversight sometimes trumps rational policy. And uh, when was that PC enough to description? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so I, I would love to give you a a firmer answer than I can give uh, about when <coughs> and and particularly as we we sitting on bank we really want to kind of um, have it in the SEC side as we look at the SEC trying to implement at the same time still grappling with technology related issues around high frequency trading, a whole new uh, potential agenda in terms of 
which may and probably should be the SEC's responsibility to put in place some level of, of rules for those public companies as they uh, are receive cyber attacks, what level of reporting they have. So this stretching of already constrained resources as they also still try to intersect with the CFTC around the whole directors issue. Uh, you ask a good question, and why not I'd love to get further ideas from this group on how we can um, make sure we don't lose kind of coming into the second questions. You know, the focus. Um, these were issues until the crisis that um, didn't receive a lot of attention. And with the evidence of the debt crisis on the European side, with our own debt limit issues, with our own deficit issues, um, I think we have to be on guard about not letting um, these issues slide to the back burner. Um, and, um, and, you know, again, I think there are areas, for example, there are still appointments senior level appointments that the administration has not made to fill out some of the important orders that you died from <coughs> that I would hope they would move quicker. Um, I would also make the point that um, we'll see tomorrow um, this the challenge the challenge is greater when many of our colleagues still seem more intent on uh, unwinding the whole process uh, rather than moving forward and fixing and improving. And you know, and that means that that perhaps inhibits a, a really kind of more robust, thorough discussion about how we kind of jointly roll up our sleeves and, and fix and improve when the game you've got a, a group of our colleagues who simply want to unwind. And I think unwinding or 18 month delays or other things, you know, God forbid we have another financial crisis, and we clearly are, I think in this country we are looking at the most predictable financial crisis in our lifetimes, and unless we can start to deal with our, our, our own debt and deficit issues in a serious way, and the ramifications that will have across our whole financial system, and if we, you know, and, and then if we have a lot of politicians shouting, why did we allow this to happen when we didn't even put in place uh, the rules, uh, as flawed as they may be in certain areas, but the kind of framework of rules uh, that we passed 10 months ago. Um, I'm not satisfied with the answer I'm giving you, but I, I think you need to keep the pressure on all of us, not to slip. And, uh, and, um, I commit that I'll try to do my part and with my colleagues. Uh, we do need to convince some of our colleagues that relitigating 18 month delays or starting from scratch, and frankly, we need assistance from the financial industry as well. That let's take this, uh, I think, generally pretty good product and improve upon it rather than let's try to roll back the clock, uh, which I don't think serves. Uh, let, let me just say uh, briefly that the, the best way for us to prepare for the next crisis, I think, is to wrap up this cycle of reform. This is the best service we can make to, to our future preparation. Uh, we have to, to, to believe that reform is good for, for the economy as much as it is good for the financial sector. Here, many people in the sector say we need to turn this page. I agree. Let's turn the full page, uh, and let's move. And 
and let's move on. This is the best way to prepare for uh, the next uh, possible crisis. Uh, because we will be establishing not only new rules, but also mechanisms of dialogue and cooperation that will allow us to react better to the next crisis because we will have the mechanism to do so across the Atlantic and, and worldwide through, through uh, the mechanisms that we are creating or about to create or implementing coming out of the future. So the best way to prepare for the next one is to close this cycle in the best possible way as soon as possible. And uh, I can tell you that the European Union is fully committed to that. On, on, the, on the Basel III uh, point, uh, uh, I mean, we, we have been discussing with the United States. This is an important point for us because it's part of the, you know, the framework that has been internationally agreed, and we believe it's important that it is implemented. Of course, we have no reasons to doubt uh, when uh, Secretary Biden tells us that the US will do so, and we have been reassured several times that that will be the case. And 